Dear Phoenix Labs, Hi, it's me, Austin the Science! Uh, okay, I don't want to get sued. Also, guy does not rhyme with Austin. Austin the Science Boston Terrier. Uh, okay, you know what? We'll table that for now. So, I've been playing this game called Dauntless a lot lately, and I mean, like, way too much. It's this game where you hunt giant monsters called behemoths, and so I spent so much time slaying these creatures that I became curious about their biology. Phoenix Labs, the uh, studio behind Dauntless, was then like, hey, do you want to do a video with us? And I was like, me? Do a video on your game? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, hell yes. And then they were like, awesome. And then I said, because I've really been wondering about the biological feasibility of the behemoths in your game. Wait, what? And whether or not the only reason they're antagonistic toward humans is because of the unsustainable human expansion into their territories and the various competitions oh, no. they have for human resources. <laughs> Thanks to Dauntless for sponsoring this episode of The Science! Dauntless is a game about the ragged remains of human society hunting down and killing giant monsters that threaten the frontier as they work to rebuild themselves from a calamity that destroyed the planet. Humans and these giant behemoths are surviving on these levitating islands that make up the remains of the planet. The lore of the game states that the islands are supported by a magical energy substance called ether, and it's also this ether that powers the various technologies in-game and, it turns out, allows behemoths to exist in the first place. Anyway, simple thesis, simple video, we can do this. Are giant monster animals like behemoths even possible? The answer is surprisingly complex, deviously interesting, and involves genetics, dinosaurs, big old insects, islands, evolution, and Coolest of all, respiration. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have ended on respiration, but it actually is the coolest part, even though it doesn't sound like it. Thankfully for Dauntless, the monsters in the game are actually not nearly as outlandish as they are in, like, say, Shadow of the Colossus's walking buildings, or else we would be in a lot of trouble. But there are still quite a few things to be concerned about. It's hard to get an exact size for the behemoths in Dauntless, but even the smallest ones, like this, uh, uh what is it, is it a beaver? A platypus? Anyway, they're the size of like a rhinoceros while the Skarn is clearly bigger than the largest terrestrial animal on earth, the African elephant. And it's worth comparing behemoths and dauntless to terrestrial earth animals because most of the behemoths seem to be scaled up versions of animals that exist in the real world. The Nasher is a platypus, the Quillshot is a wild boar, the Shrike is an owl, the Cherig is a, uh... Is that a turtle? Does that look like a turtle to you? These are clearly evolutions and lineations from the current fauna on Earth, but bigger and way more aggressive. They have become mega fauna. This is an important starting point because these animals are going to have to overcome specific challenges when it comes to surviving in the wild. Three major problems, in fact. Heat, weight, and energy consumption. And let's look at each of these in kind and then begin to address them. You may not realize this, but being alive for most creatures, and definitely for mammals, creates heat. Moving muscles, pumping hearts, all of this requires and releases a tremendous amount of energy, and given that most of the behemoths appear to be descended from mammals, this is kind of a problem. Why? Because of geometry. You see, mammals regulate heat in several different ways, but the largest by far is by blood and sweat. That's a demonetization right there. Thanks for covering my rear dauntless. And if you want to play, by the way, you could actually help our channel and me out quite a bit by clicking the link in the description. The game is free to play on PC, PS4, and Xbox, and it's even going to be on the Switch later this year. Where was I? Oh, right, sweat and blood. Uh, water is the primary ingredient in both sweat and blood, which is great because water has a very high capacity to hold and transfer heat energy, what's known as a high heat capacity. In order to regulate your body temperature and dispose of unneeded heat energy, hot blood carries itself to the surface of your skin, transfers the heat to your skin, which in turn transfers the heat to your sweat, which then evaporates, taking the heat energy away with it. This is why you feel cooler when a fan blows on you in summer. It's literally evaporating water off of your skin, and that water, which has a much higher heat capacity than your skin, pulls the heat away. Your skin is literally a giant heat sink, which is... <laughs> 
pretty freaking cool. The problems begin as you get larger, and it's best to symbolize this with a ball. Pretend that this ball of skin, okay, that is really gross, but fine, whatever. Pretend that this ball of skin is an organism. This ball organism that's one meter wide has an internal volume of 0.5 cubic meters and a surface area of little over three. Let's double the radius to two. Surface area is 12, internal volume is four. This does not sound like they are outpacing each other, but with this tiny increase in size, the surface area quadrupled, but the volume increased by eight. This means as organisms get larger, they start to have less surface area on the outside in which to evaporate heat, while the parts that are on inside, the parts that make the heat increase at twice this rate. This is why larger animals spend most of their time regulating their temperature. Elephants evolved these giant ears, not so they could hear better, but so they could just like increase their surface area. It's like if you slap two CR80EH ice pipes on top of their head, just in order to release more heat into the surrounding air. They also evolved highly wrinkled skin, which increases their skin's contact with the air, and they spend a ton of hours a day drinking water and dousing their backs with it. The next problem is a big one. Wait. Get it? Big one? Cause they're, cause, cause, cause they're big? Okay, okay, I'll just, never mind. This one's actually super simple to understand, but really difficult to fix. Basically, as organisms get bigger, they need more and thicker bones to support their organs. But as they have bigger bones, they need more muscles to move them, which increases their weight, which means they need more bones to support that weight, which means they need more muscles to move it. And oh my God, this problem never stops. Anybody who has played Kerbal Space Program is actually super familiar with this problem. Like, sure, you can make a giant rocket to haul yourself up, but the more fuel you carry, the heavier your rocket. Ergo, the more fuel you need to lift it, etc. NASA calls this the tyranny of the rocket equation, which in this case, I suppose, would be the tyranny of the skeletal system. The third problem is energy production. I'm gonna keep using elephants because it's my show and you can't stop me. An African elephant eats all day. They need 70,000 calories per day to keep all of this running, which is fine, I guess. It's not that big a deal. I mean, elephants manage it, so could conceivably behemoths. And in fact, it's here where we have to start tying all the pieces together, because while this seems like three separate problems, they're actually all interconnected. Energy, weight, and heat are all points on a triangle that feed into and counteract one another. So addressing these problems separately, once we get to these energy requirements, Environments is no longer viable. So let's zoom out and get a look at the big picture. I keep using elephants and you will have to forgive me for that because they are an excellent example of how a modern megafauna can perfectly balance this triangle for peak performance. Because while it may seem like I covered everything already, I actually haven't. I left something out of energy production or acquisition as it were. Something big, the most important key to all of this, respiration. You see, breathing comes so naturally to us that we don't think of it as energy production in the way that we think of eating food, but it totally is. It is arguably more important than eating. Actually, it's not even arguable. Oxygen is the core ingredient of almost all life that moves with any degree of speed. Walking, talking, eating, watching this video, going to work, having fun, playing video games, sleeping, all of this would be impossible without adenosine triphosphate, the fuel for almost all life on Earth. And it requires two things, glucose and oxygen. And it needs a lot of oxygen. 13 molecules worth of the stuff, six of which comes from the glucose, and the rest has to come from free oxygen delivered by the blood. Larger animals, therefore, need more oxygen to supply all their cells, which makes sense, right? But there's a problem. Respiration creates heat. So the more oxygen you take in over time, the more heat you produce, meaning that increases our heating problem. How do you even begin to deal with the runaway weight problem from an organism growing to such a huge size? Okay, let's just calm down and take a deep breath and remember that I have got you covered. There is a solution for all of this. First, the bones. We have to deal with the bones. Big animals like elephants and giant freaking dinosaurs found genius ways to deal with this problem. One is that you make the most important bones, the spine, the ribs, and the legs, just epic, just really thick 
chunky rocks. Elephants went so far as to make their leg bones nearly solid. Instead of having like hollow places where marrow goes, they have these like spongy bubbles in the bone instead, allowing their leg bones to be tremendously strong. Then you start to cut out weight everywhere you can. And you do this by just throwing away stuff you don't need. Dinosaurs like the Supersaurus did this by basically turning the rest of their bones into calcium fibers that were filled with a bunch of empty air pockets, like a streamlined racing bicycle to reduce weight. And amazingly, this is what elephants do too. They've got these big gaping holes in their skulls. This way, the bones still provide ample support for their brains and eyes, but they don't weigh them down tremendously. This does make their bones more brittle, but who cares? Like at the end of the day, what animal has the stones to try to smack an elephant in the head? It's pretty much win-win for them. Okay, so we've already gotten over how elephants deal with heat, but there's a lot more to be concerned about. How do they get the oxygen they need without bursting into flames? Well, that, that's pretty simple. They just don't breathe a lot. Elephants have a tremendously slow metabolism, taking about 12 breaths per minute. Humans, meanwhile, take about twice as many, and they also grow very, very slowly because they have overall reduced cellular activity. This is why elephant pregnancies last, no joke, 22 months. It's almost two whole years. This is the price you pay for being the largest terrestrial animal. You gotta be slower than everyone else. And this is how they manage the balance. They move slowly, they spend all day managing their heat intake, and they eat a lot. And they have probably one of the world's most efficiently designed, or I guess evolved skeletons. But here is where we begin to run into problems when we circle back to our behemoths. Behemoths do not move slowly. They do not conserve energy. These things run like as fast as cheetahs, but they are the size of two giant elephants. How is this even possible? And how am I going to explain the giant insect behemoth? I know people are going to ask me about that one. Ah! <laughs> And just as I was having a stress meltdown trying to rationalize the anatomy of a fictional creature that was clearly designed to be fun and not, you know, scientifically accurate, I cracked the case. You see, in the world of Dauntless, it's explained that ether, the mysterious energy source that serves as the catalyst of all the world's events and trials and tribulations, is the reason behemoths exist. Not only this, but they feed on it. And it's here, this right here, that reveals everything because it's wrong. They don't feed on ether, they breathe it. Oxygen is how we breathe, and oxygen is an amazing element because it is highly reactive. For this very reason, it makes a great component in rocket fuel. You mix it with hydrogen, it forms water as a byproduct, and BAM! Releases a ton of energy. This is why it's so great for our cells, but it's not the only option. In fact, it's not even the only option for us. While it's true that our bodies can't survive long without breathing oxygen, a great many of our individual cells can engage in what's known as anaerobic respiration. You most regularly experience this when you're engaging in rigorous exercise. When running, your breathing picks up to provide more oxygen to your muscle cells. But at certain speeds, your breathing can't keep up with all the demands being placed on your muscles. So instead of using oxygen and glucose, they use just glucose. And it breaks into two different pieces. One is lactic acid and the other is ATP. You just get a lot less of it than you do normally. And our bodies are not designed to operate this way for very long. But other organisms down in the bowels of the earth and even above it have found another way entirely. They can respirate with all sorts of different chemicals, nitrates, phosphates, hydrogen sulfide. If there's energy and molecules that can be taken, life will find a way to use it. It's here that I think ether is the key. In order to operate with the metabolic levels that they do, behemoths would need to find a significantly more reactive energy source than free oxygen. There's thousands of more reactive compounds out there in the universe, like really too many to name, and ether is literally everywhere. It's literally pouring out of geysers in the ground whenever you fight behemoths. And this makes total sense. Did you know that back in prehistoric Earth, animals and especially insects used to be much larger? And one of the reasons is because oxygen concentrations were way, way higher. This was particularly important for invertebrates like bugs got there, which respirate through their skin using organs called tracheas, different from our tracheas. It's why in the modern day, bugs as large as they used to be simply cannot exist. And while there are some large animals like 
elephants, they have to dramatically slow their metabolism in order to survive. But if a species could evolve to take advantage of a more abundant, more energetic source of respiration, it would be a total game changer. All those problems with heat, weight, and energy requirements would just go out the window. Interestingly enough, this means that behemoths still have to eat a lot because they need all the building blocks of nutrients and minerals to keep their bodies, you know, working. And it's here where my favorite piece of the puzzle comes into play. Floating islands. Behemoths live on islands in relatively isolated ecosystems, and this is the reason they are so large. It is a well-documented phenomenon in the creation of megafauna, where they're tremendously more likely to evolve on islands. This is what's known as island gigantism. It's presumed that, in insulated and minimally chaotic conditions, evolution favors growing to a large size because there's less predation. This means that the biggest threat to to a species is usually others of its own species. This isolationism from predators favors severely territorial behavior, even among herbivores, so they can fight off anybody else who may threaten their resources. Just look at Komodo dragons. Island? Check. Giant? Check. Territorial? Check. If they had access to a more efficient form of respiration, they'd probably be the size of elephants. Is there a, is there a Komodo dragon behemoth yet? Well, does it, does the dress count? Given everything in-game, the abundant source of energy, the isolationism, not only are behemoths possible, it'd actually be more surprising if they didn't exist. It even explains why they're total freaking jerks all the time. So, you know, given all these caveats, I'm gonna label behemoths as solidly plausible. I don't, hey, this is just a fun fact that's not actually super important, but did you know that there used to be like thousands of times more megafauna in like recent-ish history, but there's mass extinction events of megafauna in tons of areas that coincide with the arrival of humans and our ancestor species, this implies that megafauna competed with invading humans for resources, and as a result, we hunted them off the face of the earth just to show them who's boss. Again, it's not super important, but it's just, you know, kind of like what you do in Dauntless. Human expansion, competition for ether as an energy source, and you know, us murdering them en masse, making coats out of their skins as a message to their families. If you would like to murder cartoonishly large monsters and make coats out of them in order to shame them into getting out of the way of an invasive simian species bent on overspreading and eliminating them off the planet, you don't have to wait. You can download Load and play for free on PC, PS4, and Xbox right now by going to playdauntless.com slash r slash the game theorist or the much easier way of clicking the link in the description below. See if you can find me killing monsters today. My character looks like a sexy buff frontman for an emo band. Sincerely, Austin.